Good morning, church. Great to see you back from nine days with the flu. Oh, my goodness. That was brutal. Pray for my son. He's still about five days behind me in the recovery trajectory. I think we caught something in a dark, evil cave. <laughs> Raise your hand if you've ever been caving. Yeah? Okay. All right. Now, I'm not talking about, like, outside repelling or anything like that or any light spelunking or anything like that. Here's a little picture here. and <laughs> Every time, that's me kind of in the back. You can see Milo kind of back left. Smiling, this, this would be the last time we would smile. And uh, I feel like, is it just me? This is something you'd see on CNN, like, and they were never seen again. This is the last known photo of this group, right? It just kind of had that ominous foreboding. I should have thought, I should have known. I don't know what I was thinking, y'all, but I, I guess I was expecting this right here when they said we're going caving. Like, it's just going to be a leisurely stroll, you know? It's, it's handicap accessible. It's well lit. There's... there's Smooth roadways, railings, bathrooms, I don't know, maybe a snack bar or something at the end of it, right? This is what I was expecting. However, this is what I got, all right? That's me coming out. Yes, I am, if you look, I am sweating profusely. I am in absolute agony and misery because what they didn't tell me was on the ground was dust this thick, you're breathing it in, I'm, sweat I'm the only one sweating, I don't know what's going on, and I'm gasping, and you're having like army crawl, and then it gets closer and closer, you can't even army crawl, so you're doing this little fingertip thing <laughs> with your toes, and it is awful. I mean, it's awesome, but it's awful. It's terrific, but it's terrifying. And I'm getting cut up, I'm bleeding, I've got a gash on my stomach, all this and I get out, like, notice my son, he's still standing right there, he's like, I'm a, my dad is not going to die. On my watch, and he was so awesome. He stayed with me. The rest of the group, they're long gone. I'm, I'm bringing up the rear, and uh, there's this, there's these uh, obstacles that become. We, Gavin, you want to show the next one? I've got this, this picture. There's Milo at the top of this, this cliff. That the only way down was to slide, and then to have this drop off. And over here at the end, this guide. By the way, the guide was 19 years old. Okay, and I think he weighed 19 pounds. And he, he said, I'm going to stand here. Y'all slide down because I'm going to block you from falling off into this death-defying. We couldn't even see the bottom. I was like, I'm not even shining my light. Light didn't even go that far. It was such a, a pit of despair. And I'm like, if I come screaming off that thing, this little 19-pound guy is not going to stop me. <laughs> Something was lost in translation. When I accepted, they said, you want to go caving? I'm like, absolutely, I want to go caving. It sounds like a manly thing. This is a father-son retreat. This is a spiritual high part of our life. He becomes a man. And they didn't ask me my height. They didn't ask me my weight. They didn't ask me my age. They asked nothing. And I was by far the oldest, uh, shall we say, least athletic person on that tour. Guys, it was misery. But I wouldn't trade it for anything. I'm so glad I got to share that pain, I mean experience with my son. As I look back at it, I learned something, and I'm going somewhere spiritual with this. This is going to set the table for, for what we're going to be here in Proverbs 15. On the next obstacle that came, I watched all these people, far more athletic, far younger, far more spry, scurry up these cliffs and do, 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 and they're just people like Spider-Man going up and around. And I'm just looking at it, just getting more and more depressed. <laughs> like, how in the world am I supposed to get? And then it's almost as if a little flicker, I'd like to think it was the Holy Spirit, said, go talk to the guide. So I walked over to our esteemed 19-year-old guide, and I said, my brother, talk to me. That is a no-go for me. Like, I just, we're like only two hours in. We got another two or three hours of this. And he said, I, is there any other way? Is there any other route? Can I meet you somewhere? Is there like a, like a backstage pass or something I don't know about? And he said, oh, absolutely. You don't have to do just walk right around here. Just go around. I'll meet you in the other room. Be right there. I said, are you serious? Like, I almost kissed him. I was so excited. And he goes, yeah, you just walk right around. Just go right there. We'll, we'll meet you right there. I'm like, done. <laughs> so I just saunter right over there. Do, 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 do. Everybody's sliding down the rocks of death. And I'm, laying, I'm like, what's up, guys? I'm like, did you come? I'm like, sure, yeah, we, we all did it together, right? No. I didn't lie, but I did, I did learn something in that moment. You see, I went up to the guide. I never would have found the better path had I not swallowed my pride and asked him for help. And guys, just like that, hear me. 
every day in life. We may not find that better path that God has for us if we don't stop and ask the guide. For, see what I did there? Huh? I went all spiritual on you. How many times do we miss the better path because in our own pride, we think, I got this. Or because we forget to seek godly counsel from somebody who may be further along the path. Or because we think, well, you know, everybody's going this way. Surely this is the safe way. That, that wasn't the safe way. That's the way of death. But I wouldn't have known there was a better way had I not stopped and asked. And that's kind of the big idea for us today. If you're taking notes, one of the most difficult things in life is to know what you don't know. You know what I'm talking about? There are known knowns. There are known unknowns, things we think we don't know. And then there are unknown unknowns. We don't even know what we don't know, right? And I think this right here kind of sums it up. In fact, you know what? For us guys, let's be honest, man. If we're being honest, it actually should say this. Gavin, go to that next one. One of the most difficult things in life is to know and admit what you don't know. Right, guys? Right. I'm not lost. Taking the scenic route. I'm not lost. The GPS is wrong. Right? You'll be there in 22 minutes. Challenge accepted, right? I, I'll make it in 21 minutes. You, you know you do that. I think one of the hardest things we do is admit we don't know everything. For instance, if you're a Marine, you're headed off to boot camp for the very first time, how could you possibly know how ignorant you were until that drill instructor comes, gets in your face, and reminds you of your ignorance? It was at this moment when Timmy realized this was not the bus to summer camp, right? But until he got there, he probably thought he knew a lot. Until somebody came and reminded you, hey, you may not know it. One of the most difficult things in life is to know and then admit we don't know. So how are you doing with that? And how do you discover what it is that you don't know? How do you avoid potholes and landmines if you never saw them coming? God, I got great news. Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, looked ahead and he left us a trail, a treasure map. Right here in Proverbs 15, you can go ahead and pull it up if you want. Proverbs 15, while you pull that up, let me welcome our online campus. Great to have you with us online. If you're homesick, praying for you to get better. And if you're a guest for the first time in this big room, welcome. My name is Matt Mitchell. I am the lead pastor here, one of several teaching pastors. And uh, we're so thankful that you chose to be with us today. We're going to be in Proverbs 15. I'm going to start in the CSB translation, an awesome, very literal, conservative translation. We start there. We can move out from there. Proverbs 15, read this with me. It says, a wise son brings joy to his father, but a foolish man despises his mother. Foolishness brings joy to one without sense, but a person with understanding, what? Walks a straight path. Plans fail when there is no counsel, but with many advisors, they succeed. Did you catch that? All right, let's read it again in the NLT translation. Sensible children bring joy to their father. Foolish children despise their mother. Foolishness brings joy to those with no sense. A sensible person stays on the right path. Plans go wrong for lack of advice. Many advisors bring success. Mm -mm -mm. Did you catch that? So how can you know what you don't know? Well, right there, it says you seek advice from advisors. Specifically, you want to seek the right advice from the right advisors. Seek godly counsel in the big decisions you have, in the things that are keeping you up at night, that stuff that is stressing you out right now. Seek godly advice. You do not have to do this alone. We have an army of people who are further down the road of life than you are. Seek them out. We can seek not only the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit speaks in us. He speaks through his word. We can talk to each other. We can encourage each other. I, don't, I think we know that, and we think, well, pastor, that's pretty basic, right? Seek good advice from good people. Well, yeah, it's basic, but we don't do it. <laughs> we still don't do it. We know it. It's head knowledge, but we still don't do it. There's a great funny story. It's famous. Some of you may have heard it. story of an older married couple sitting on the front porch, minding their own business, when suddenly the wife looks at her husband and says, do you know what the two biggest problems are in this world today? To which the husband, without missing a beat, says, I don't know. And frankly, I don't care. To which she lights up and says, yes! Yes, how did you know? And he says, what? I don't know. Ignorance. And I don't care. Apathy. 
Ignorance and apathy are the two biggest problems that we see today. Why don't we, if we know we should seek godly wisdom, how come we don't do it? Right here, that story of the older couple on that front porch reveals two of the main reasons why we don't seek advice as followers of Christ. The first one is this one. We think we already know what we need to know, which actually reveals ignorance. Because the older you get, the more you will realize you don't know. And that's okay. The second reason, it's too much work to figure out how to get advice. It takes effort. It's hard. That's apathy. The Bible has a better term for it. It's called slothfulness. Sloth. I love, say that word with me. Slothfulness. Don't you just picture like a slow sloth just kind of hanging in there, just lazy. That's such a descriptive word. We get those two, but you know what? There's a third one that Solomon is hinting at here. And this is a doozy. This is the third reason why we don't seek godly counsel more often. It feels better to have people think <laughs> we know what we're doing. It feels better to have people assume we know what's going on, right? Let's fake it till you make it. Shake and bake, Ricky Bobby. We know where we're going. We got this. Christian, can I say something? In an era of rampant self-absorption and me generation and pride, humility goes a long way. Jesus had such humility. He was so kind, so gracious, so bold, so masculine, so self-assured because of, of the relationship with the Father, the Holy Spirit. All, but he was still so incredibly humble and gracious. I think sometimes we plow ahead and we make plans because of pride with no counsel, no input. Maybe we could get it, but maybe we are scared to get it, or maybe we don't want to ask certain people. So many plans fail, and then we're shocked, and we go, well, I don't know what went wrong. Surely this was a great plan. Well, that's because we were probably operating in human wisdom. We were going it alone, which we were never meant to do. And I think if we do get counsel, we end up getting bad counsel because we get it from the wrong people. Which brings us to our next question this morning. Why don't we seek advice from the wise people, from wise counselors? And the first answer to that, if we're being honest, is it is so much easier to get advice from casual, common friends. You know what I'm talking about? Now, here's the deal, guys. There's nothing inherently wrong about asking your friends for advice. There's nothing wrong with that at all. It's great to have friends. They're with you in the seas of life. They're walking with you. They have everything in common. But the downside is they aren't much further down the road of life than you are. That's why they're your buddies. That's why they're walking beside you. They're not further down the road. They're great for fellowship. They're great for friendship. There's nothing wrong with that. But they're beside you for a reason. Sometimes our friends... They don't want to hurt our feelings. And because of that, they may not tell you what you really need to hear. I get it. It's easy. Nobody wants to be a jerk. Nobody wants to come across as a know-it-all. So it's just easier to kind of pull back. You've done it. I've done it. I don't want to hurt their feelings. You know what? We'll just let it slide. Maybe wish the best for them. <laughs> Thoughts, happy feelings. That's, that's the downside of friendship is they're right alongside you. The second reason that we don't seek advice from wise counselors is it's just easier to follow the herd. It's so easy. Andy Stanley calls this phenomenon the uh, herd assumption. You know what this is? This is the, uh, the herd assumption, assuming that everyone you know is doing something the same way, and if they are, it's got to be proven, tested, verifiable, and safe, and great, and awesome, and the way to go. Surely, everybody can't be wrong. Surely, Everybody, if they're going this way, surely this way, surely everybody has three mortgages. Surely everybody has four leased vehicles and five maxed out cards and filling out a HELOC, trying to get, see what I'm saying? If everybody's doing it and this is the way of a uh, pastor, what's wrong? Surely everybody, if they're going this way, if we're going down there, I mean, everybody's working 65, 70, 80 hours a week, pastor, and they don't get to see their wife or their kids and they wonder why they're going crazy and see them for a couple minutes on the weekends, but if everybody's doing it, surely it's going to work out. I mean, I don't really have time to read your word and gather with other like-minded believers who help me stay on the straight and narrow, but that's okay because 78% of the morning crew woke up today and didn't gather. I mean, surely the majority is never wrong. 
There's a great true story I was just thinking when I was talking to my wife. I want to put up a picture. I've never showed this picture before. This is a rare peek into uh, our Atlanta trip to see Amy's side of the family. This is her dad in the middle. This is Poppy. Hi, Poppy. How are you doing? This is Marin, and you recognize Milo up top left. This is uh, Forrester, the cousin. And the guy I really want to direct it is Uncle Trey on the far right. We're making dumplings here. We're dropping them in the thing, making do, 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 awesome dumplings. I'll try to bring you some. And I'm just kind of over here with Amy and Mimi, and we're just, just, you know, cutting some more, getting ready to hand them some of the batter to drop in. And I overhear Uncle Trey pipe up, and it stopped my heart. And he was, <laughs> he was sitting there talking to Marin about, you know, hey, you know, I know you're homeschooled, I know this, and here's how you want to do it. And finally, he just said, listen, Marin, I want to tell you something. I'm going to give you a little Uncle Trey wisdom. Follow the crowd, and you'll never be led astray. And my head snapped up, and I said, what's that? I said, follow the crowd. Never, everybody can't be wrong. And I said, what? That is terrible advice. And he said, relax. I'm just kidding, right? Thankfully, my kids knew he was kidding. Amy knew he was kidding. But in my mind, I'm like, follow the crowd, and you'll never be led. What if the crowd's walking off a cliff? What if the herd is marching towards certain death? This is terrible advice. And they're like, Easy, Padre. It's okay. We all know it was kidding. But guys, how many times do we watch our friends and our family do this? They're walking down a road that is not safe, that is not good for them, and we don't give them godly advice, and we know where that road ends, and it's a dead end, and it's not good. Or maybe it's leading to a bad place, and, and, and it's too late for them to do much about it because they didn't get off the road. I just read just this week about a true story about a man named Dashrith Manji. This is way back in 1965, a man living in India, a rural town in a rocky mountain, treacherous uh, chain of, of mountains. And it said the nearest doctor was actually located on the far side of the mountain range, which was a horrible, long, dangerous trek to get there. And one day, Manji's wife was carrying water, as she normally does, around this horrible, dangerous path, and the unthinkable happened. She slipped and she fell down the mountainside with the weight of water crashing down on her. People finally got down to her, and they looked, and they knew right away that she was in immediate medical peril. However, the problem was medical care was still hours away because it had to take that exact same treacherous path to get to her. And by the time the medical doctors were able to get to Manji's wife, tragically, she had already died. See, they were going down that same path, the path everyone had taken, for years, this was the only way. And in that moment, overcome with grief and desperation, Manji famously now made a solemn commitment that he would, the rest of his life, dedicate it to carving a new path through this mountain so that no one would ever experience the same tragedy and pain that he was going through losing his wife. So the next day, he showed up with just a rock, chisel, and a hammer and the villagers laughed. And they said, there's no way. You're a scrawny man, you're untrained, you're not wealthy, you don't have any laborers, you're gonna do this all by yourself in the scorching Indian heat for the summer and the bitter cold, bone chilling winters? There is no way. But he had such commitment, guys, it was unwavering and he didn't stop. Year after year after year, Manji chipped away at this mountain. For the next 22 years, I put that in perspective. Potter's Hand just celebrated its 21st year. This dude has been chipping away with a hammer and chisel for a year longer than we have been in existence. He worked on this. Now in his 70s, he recently broke through the mountain. Ended up carving 360 feet through the mountain, a path over 10 feet wide that could get a cart through it. Think about it. People laughed at him. But because of his determination, his commitment to say, there has to be a better path. Now, instead of medical care taking 55 kilometers, he broke through and cut it down to just a few short miles. And now everybody had easy access to life-saving care. The herd mentality says, don't bother with that because it's easier just to follow what someone else did. But think about this guy. If Manji had done that, y'all, there would be no new road. Because it's easy for us to just go along, isn't it, church? It's easy for us to just take the easy road. Who are you following? Young people, ask yourself, who, is, who are you emulating? 
employees. Is your boss worth emulating? Workers, think about this. Mom, dad, what level of, of commitment are we following with our grandparents? Are we making the exact same mistakes? When we look for the, if we're following people that are giving us godly counsel and they live an awesome God life, that's awesome. But we have to make sure we're not emulating those who are taking us down a rough road. So what's the secret to getting good counsel? Solomon actually has something. This is so good. He says this in Proverbs 1.5. He says, let the wise listen and add to their learning and let the discerning get guidance. In other words, when you listen to counsel, you get wiser. Discerning people listen to the guidance and then they get further down the path they want to go. So I want to leave you with three of Solomon's secrets to getting good counsel, all right? If you're taking notes, the first one is this. Ask more than one person's advice, all right? Ask more than one person's advice. Look at 11, 14 of Proverbs. It says, for a lack of guidance, a nation falls, but many advisors make victory sure. Read those last five words again. Many advisors make victory sure. A few? No. One? No. Many. How are you doing with that? It's easy to just ping one person or two. That's, that's the easy part. The hard part is being intentional. He says, many advisors. When we have a big decision in our life, Amy and I, we pray about it. I seek her counsel. She's been with me in ministry for 30 years. I seek other people's counsel. I seek our leadership team of elders, meeting with them just today. And I bounce ideas and we seek counsel because it says many advisors make victory secure. The second thing, don't let pride keep you from admitting what you don't know. There's that word again, pride. I think that is probably one of the most number one enemies of seeking godly counsel. But Proverbs 13, 10, right there says, pride only breeds quarrels. Wisdom is found in those who take advice. Look closely at that. Do you notice the word that Solomon adds before advice? Take. It's an action word. you catch that? He said, you want to be wise? You want to be further ahead in your Christian faith? He's saying they seize it. It's an active word. They, they, they take it. They seize it. They run with it. They absorb it. They don't just hear, oh, that's nice. I may, I may not. They run with this because they admit the fact they don't know everything, and they're quick to go to people who know more. And then Solomon describes it yet again in that next verse. He says, the way of a fool seems right to him, but a wise man, what? Listens to advice. Do you see what he's saying? He's saying the way of a fool, the path of a fool seems right to him. So what does this look like in the real world? Right? I love practical applications. You guys know this. Let's say a friend comes up to you and says, hey, you know I love you. I've been watching you. We've been close friends for a while. But i got to tell you something. I'm a little concerned about something I'm seeing in your life. I just wanted to be a friend and bring it to you in private. A fool says, whatever. I'm fine. I got this. I'm wise in my own eyes, right? I know the road I'm going. I'm good. But look at what a wise person would say. A wise person, what? Listens to advice. A wise person, that goes up to that friend and says, really? I'm thankful you care. Tell me what you see. And then they listen. A dad goes to his son. Mom goes to his daughter and says, hey, you know I love you, right? <laughs> that always gets your attention. <laughs> you know I love you, right? I want to share something with you. I, I think some of the decisions you're making are taking you down a road that you really don't want to go. Daughter, you know I love you. I think some of the friends you're hanging out with are not the best influence, and I have some concerns. Well, the foolish son and the foolish daughter says, whatever. <laughs> whatever, Mom. Whatever, Dad. You're so old. But a wise son, a wise daughter says, these people love me more than anybody, and they only have my best interest in heart. You know what? Tell me what you're seeing, and they listen. What that scripture says, a wise man listens to this godly advice. Think about that. A boss, a supervisor comes up to the employee and says, hey, listen, I know you've been trying this, but uh, it may be none of my business, but can I give you some free advice? Well, the foolish laborer there says, yeah, I do mind, <laughs> and it's none of your business. But the wise employee says, you know what? I will take all the advice and counsel I can get. What you got? And they listen. Do you see the difference? Do you see how this applies? 
Bring this into your real world. Don't let this be some cerebral, spiritual thing only. This has practical meaning to us today, which actually leads us to Solomon's final secret. Take counsel from those who've been where you want to go. Take counsel from those who have arrived at the places you're hoping to be. That is your destination. Some of us wonder why our plans fail, and I think we're shocked. Maybe it's because they weren't good laid plans. Maybe we didn't ask for it, you know? Pridefully, I think we think we know everything. We don't need anyone's help. But God's word says, this is the opening scripture, plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors, they succeed. Your life is on a path. It is either taking you toward where you want to go or it's taking you away. There's no neutral. There is a very real spiritual battle waging for your soul. We are either following Jesus or we're following our own path. The secret to getting good counsel is first knowing that you need it. Second, it's seeking it from multiple reliable sources and then listening to it. Admitting you don't know even things that you don't know. Take counsel from the right people, from people we respect. Seek counsel from people who have arrived, oh, here's a good one, who have arrived with their character intact, who have arrived with their integrity and their reputation and their testimony. There is a huge difference between the right road and the easy road. See, the easy road is the one that doesn't seek counsel or it ignores counsel. I had a friend not, not long ago call me up and ask me for advice and spent a long time on the, on the phone and as soon as we hung up, they went and did the exact opposite of everything I poured myself into. I was in my mind going, why would you even waste your time asking if you have no intention of, of taking advice? If you're going to do your own thing anyway, go do your own thing. We have to not only hear it, but we have to seek it, accept it, and act on it. The wise man, the wise woman seek counsel from wise people. They listen to it, and they walk a path where they want to go. So, you know, i got to ask, how about you? How are you doing with leading a life of wisdom? That's why I love Proverbs and Psalms. Every summer we get to dive in. Imagine what your life would be like if you developed a habit, not of being impulsive with your decisions, but also not being indecisive either, but prayerfully consulting older, wiser, more successful people in the faith than where you are. How much better, if you could go back and talk to your younger self, would your finances be? How much better would your relationships be if you would go back in time, hop in the Wayback Machine, and say, I want to seek advice from people who are further down the road spiritually than me. This mentorship, this discipleship, this is why small groups are so key. This is why, no matter how old I get, I'm still seeking people older than me and saying, hey, what do you see? What potholes, what blind spots do you see? What can we do here? So what are you going to do with this advice today? When you just heard Proverbs, you just heard Solomon speak, if I were to give you some counsel, the first thing I would say to you is this. Ask God to show you the counselors he has for you. This is part of your homework assignment. Ask God. Pray about it. It's not a mystery. Remember, he's more excited for you to discover his will than you are. God, what counselors do you have for me? The second counsel I would give you, seek advice this week from somebody who's where you want to be. From somebody who is further down the road than you are, okay? The third piece of counsel I would give you, finish the book of Proverbs. Ah, oh, this is great. If you've been reading this regularly since we began this series, then you're actually close to finished right now. Proverbs has 31 chapters. There's a little over 31 days left in this summer. If you, make the, if you haven't already, you can make this commitment today. Take wise counsel. This is the book of wisdom, by the way, written mostly from the wisest man who's ever lived. You can read one a day and be done by the time summer ends. I'm so ready for summer to be over. So ready to stop sweating profusely, just walking outside. Next bit of advice I would give, continue to gather with like-minded believers. Bless you. Continue to gather with those who bring you up, with people who have your best interest at heart. We're growing in wisdom every week. We're not done yet. Keep gathering. Keep having uh, like-minded believers around you, allowing your mind to soak in truth. And your last homework assignment, follow Jesus. Follow Jesus. You know what I love about this? I was just reminded this week, during the time Jesus was on earth, this is the phrase he used more than any other. Did you know that? He said, follow me. Follow me. 
follow me. You know what's cool about that? That's a directional command. You can't, it's not optional. It's not saying, hey, if it's convenient, you may want to check out what I'm doing. I kind of know what I'm doing. Right? He said, follow me. Follow me. I love, walk behind me. Right? He'll blaze the trail. He's going through the creepy cave, and he is with the flashlight. He is taking you. Walk the path I'm walking. He says, come to me, all of you who are weary, who are beat up, who are burdened, and I will give you rest. Come to me. Follow me. And the yoke that I will place on you as we walk this road together is light. It will seem light on your journey. As we walk this road together, I am gentle, and I am humble in heart. And as you follow me, you will find rest for your soul. I don't know about you, but that sounds like a path I want to walk. Follow Jesus. If I can encourage you, one thing, follow Jesus. Seek this godly counsel. Seek him first. All these other things will come into their proper place. All right, so here's what we're going to do. I'm going to pray for you, and then I've got a couple cool things I want to share with you. All right, let's bow together. God, we seek your wisdom. We thank you for your, your word that is timeless and, and full of truth and life and life-giving. Would you help us to follow you, to not get ahead of you, to not go and do our own thing, and to not lag behind, but to walk behind you, to follow after you. God, give us a heart that is hungry for things of you. Give us a heart that hungers for righteousness and holiness, full of mercy, grace, truth, even justice, Lord. Give us that balance that you so powerfully embodied. You are so good. Thank you that you didn't leave us in a dark cave. Thank you that you left us light. And I pray, Lord, that we would walk in light, that you would give us wisdom far beyond our years. We ask this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen and amen. And speaking of praying, something very important. We've only done this one other time, but it's our second annual. We're having this Saturday our prayer walk. If you didn't get to participate in this last year, this is your chance. It is going to be so much fun. It is awesome. It is powerful. We're going to meet at the East Campus. That's the same building if you're new here, just at the other end of the sidewalk. We've got a lobby. We'll go in, and we'll set, I'll have everything set up. You get a free T-shirt if you come. We have our, our guides that actually show you which route that you can walk. If you want to do the full walk, it's only 1.7 miles. Everyone gets one of these. And as you walk, you just simply pray. I even got a little prayer card for you that will help you know which path. We've got a new housing subdivision just opened up, I think 700 units that has just opened up that needs to know there's a person with an earshot that loves them. You might be that person. We might go left that way. This is a really cool thing. We have some pictures of this. It's a very simple thing. When you gather, we'll meet at the, at the huddle table here. We'll pray. I'll give you your shirt. You see them in the bottom right corner. Everybody gets a prayer card. And then you say, well, what do I do? I've never done one. You have the prayer suggest and the scripture prompts right here. Literally, you walk through. God, we're going to pray for our community. I pray that you will help our students be lights for Christ in the school. And then you walk down. Lord, I want to pray for our kids. I want to pray over our city. I want to pray for our state, for our leaders, for the hurting, for salvations, for life change. Over here, you have scriptures. Lord, your word tells us in Jeremiah 29, seek the peace and prosperity of the city which I have carried you. Pray, Lord, for this today, for peace for our city, that it will prosper as you are lifted up. And it's got all these scriptures, okay? So if you've never done one, this will demystify it. Don't freak out. I know it may not be a very uh, popular thing anymore to pray, but this is where we put our feet and our faith in action. This is a chance to come out of your comfort zone and be a light to the community, to leave these walls. These holy huddles are awesome, but this is just one hour in the week. This is a chance. Prayer is powerful. This is where God moves so much in our heart. And it's only 30 minutes if you want to walk. It doesn't take long or an hour. Somebody said, well, Pastor Matt, I, I, you know, I've got bum knees. Or I can't do it. We have people that are willing. If you want to stay on campus to go into the chapel, you can pray on site. You can pick a quiet room. We had several that just circled our campus and prayed for us and for each other and for our church. Lifted up health concerns or salvation mem uh, members who are, who are lost. We've got a uh, new path. We can go this way, a path down. We don't go in a big herd. We stagger it. Somebody said, is it a mob? Is it scary? We all walk it down. We're in the same shirts like we're a cult coming down. We're going to get you. No, no, nothing like that. We wait. You can kind of see, uh, where is it, that top middle one. We waited. You see Jason and Courtney. They'll go, and they'll walk a little bit. Somebody will wait, go across the street, and walk down another path similar. And we kind of stagger it. It's this beautiful 
way that we can just touch people because God just may put somebody in your path. There may be a divine appointment. You might see a neighbor, and if God opens up the door, seize it. Hey, what are you guys doing? You're all a bunch of weirdos. Yeah, we're not. Well, we are weird, but still, why don't you come? Ed, did you know we're the closest church to your neighborhood? We just want you to know that we're here. We love you. Is there anything we can pray for you? We just wanted, you know, no strings attached, love. We're just here in the neighborhood, just praying for our, our community. That's it. You may not run into anybody. You may, but just be open to that. It's an awesome, really cool chance for us to get outside of these walls and let people know that they are loved. All right? So that's the, that's the first thing. When is that? This Saturday, 1030. All right? If you come, you get a shirt. Uh, first 30 people, I think I've got at least 30 shirts. And uh, going to be a really, really awesome day. Come and just do it as long as you want. And then you don't have to report back. You can send me an email later and let me know if you had any divine appointments, something powerful happened. But you can go and then head off to whatever appointments you had, all right? So it's a drop-in, very, very cool. Very, we tried to make this as, as easy an on-ramp for anyone who wants to participate. Lastly, this is so cool. Am I on time? Perfect. I'm going to send you out. We have a video. If you're new to the church, one of the heartbeats of our church is to plant other churches who plant churches so that we have not only children, but we have grandchildren, and we see people coming to know Christ all over the city. We have helped launch 37 churches in the last two years. Our very first church plant was Grace City. Some of you may remember Pastor Daniel. This past week, Pastor Daniel's church became self-sufficient. Three are three are committed. Yeah, that's a big deal. You can applaud that. That's, that's for sure. That is awesome. So we have finished our three-year commitment with them financially to bless them. And he just wanted to just send to you a quick Thank you. And I said, you know what? I'm going to show it to the whole church so you guys can hear his heart and his appreciation. What's up, Pastor Matt? This is Pastor Dan at Grace City Church. What's up, Potter's Hand Church? I just wanted to take a moment to thank you guys for your support of Grace City Church. Uh, we are going on four years. Can you believe it's been four years? And I just want to reach out because Pastor Matt and Potter's Hand, your congregation has been there. Uh, from the very, very beginning, supporting us uh, financially. And uh, we're just truly grateful. Uh, we got some baptisms coming up this week. We've seen lives uh, come to the Lord, been baptized. We've seen some amazing things happening over the last few years. And this does not happen without your financial support. And so we are truly grateful uh, for the support that you've given us over the years. Uh, it has been tremendous. And I just wanted to reach out on behalf of Grace City Church, our family here, uh, my, my wife, First Lady Kiafwa, we just want to say thank you uh, for the blessing that you, Pastor Matt, and the Potter's Hand Church have been to us here at Grace City and myself. So we thank you. God bless you. Love you. And prayerfully, we will see you soon. God bless.